Hey friends, Mike Maltzo here. We're at the Metabolic Health Summit live with Dr. David Ludwig. We're going to talk about his recent analysis, co-authored with uh, Dr. Cara Ebeling and many other folks. So this is uh, Dr. Ludwig. You gave an excellent presentation last night, uh, all about uh, how nutrition, diet, everything affects uh, appetite, obesity, and so forth. But one aspect about your your study that you recently published, and I'll link below, friends, was this subgroup that may be particularly that may benefit particularly well um, from a low-carbohydrate diet with folks with high insulin levels. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. Well, what the study aimed to do is examine whether the type of calories you consume affect the number of calories you burn. And so we first brought people's weight down by, we had 164 participants, we brought their weight down by about 10 or 12%. So for a typical person that in our study, that would be 20, 25 pounds. That's going to put the body under some metabolic stress. We know that after weight loss, metabolism slows down and the body is primed to regain the weight. So that's the purpose of that initial run-in phase. Then we randomly assigned our participants to low, medium, or high carb diets. So 20, 40, or 60% carbohydrate. And we did one more thing. We kept their weight the same by adjusting their calories that we gave them uh, to maintain weight stability over five months. So during, this was a feeding study where we had very close control over what people were eating. Uh, we actually fed them 160,000 meals as part of this very wow. large study. Um, and the main finding was that at the same body weight, the participants on the low carb, 20% carb diet had a faster metabolic rate. They were burning 200 to 250 calories a day more using a method called doubly labeled water or stable isotopes. That's considered the gold standard. But we're all not, the, we're all not alike and we also saw that there was a group of people who were especially sensitive to the amount of carbohydrate they're getting. These are uh, called the people with high insulin secretion. We measure that with an oral glucose tolerance test, looking at insulin 30 minutes after the oral glucose. So the people who were primed to make a lot of insulin at that 30 minute time point, mm -hmm. well these are the people who are presumably going to have a lot more trouble if they're eating a lot of carbohydrate because we know that carbohydrate produces the most demand for the most insulin. And so that's what we saw that among that group, the high insulin secretors, the effect of diet was especially large, over 400 calories a day. Whereas for the low insulin secretors, there wasn't much of an effect at all, meaning that if you happen to be a low insulin secretor, uh, a low or a high carbohydrate diet isn't going to affect your metabolism very much. This is consistent with a number of other studies. Uh, it doesn't mean that eating a lot of processed carbohydrates is going to be good for your cardiovascular diabetes risk factors, but in terms of metabolism, uh, one size clearly doesn't fit all. And this might help explain some of the variability between studies. If one investigator happens to get more low insulin secretors and another gets more high insulin secretors, well, they might be looking at different parts of the elephant, so to speak. So we need an integrated view, and that's one of the advantages of a study as large as ours. This is one of the largest feeding studies of this topic ever done. And longest um, term, right? Longest duration? That's right. So we, five months of the, the test diets, 164. And that contrasts to many of the, most of the studies that have been done to date, which might you know, be lucky to have a dozen or two participants studied for just a few days or a few weeks. We know that metabolism doesn't adapt to a low carbohydrate diet that quickly. Mm -hmm. So that was the neat reason for doing a longer term study. There's always the, uh, you know, the tendency to want short term results, to interpret short term results, to understanding long term effects. But um, we do that you know, uh, with uh, you know, great risk to be misinterpreting uh, the data. Amazing point. You know, one thing that you, you hit on there was this adaptive thermogenesis. You talked about it in the paper. When people lose weight, their resting metabolic rate decreases. Do you want to speak to that and maybe that there might be different outcomes in, in so-called adaptive thermogenesis and like a high-carb, low-calorie diet versus a you know, low-carb, low-calorie type diet? Right. Well, according to the model we're investigating called the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, the problem isn't so much overeating as a primary cause of obesity. 
we look at the other side of the equation. And uh, so this model says that overeating doesn't cause obesity over the long term. It's the process, the body's process of getting fat that drives overeating. Now that might sound a little surprising, but think of what happens in pregnancy. We know that the mother, pregnant mother, eats a lot. Um, she's very hungry, consumes hundreds of calories more, and the fetus is growing rapidly. But which is, which is uh, the source of this? Is, does the mother eating those extra calories make the fetus grow? Or does the growing fetus sucking up those calories cause the mother to be hungry and, or, and eat more? And we know that it, it is the latter. So why couldn't that be the case in obesity? If we had fat cells that were triggered to take in too many calories, triggered by all of the processed carbohydrates in our environment that raise insulin, other environmental factors. Those fat cells take in too many calories, there aren't enough for the rest of the body, and that's why we get hungry. And if we ignore that hunger, which is very difficult for most people to do, but even if you could, the body would fight back in other ways, most specifically with lowering metabolic rate. So in effect, when people who are, have obesity go on a low calorie diet, their body goes into starvation mode long before their weight goal is anywhere in sight. They may still have 50 excess pounds of fat in the body, but the brain isn't seeing that. The brain is registering starvation. If this is the case, if the carbohydrate insulin model is right, then we need to address obesity differently. We need to target the metabolic defect in the fat cells, specifically by lowering insulin levels, helping fat cells open up, release those calories. And when that happens, according to this theory, the body is flooded with calories that had been previously stored. The brain perceives that as a better metabolic state. There's more calories available. We're less hungry, which is commonly reported on low-cal diets, low-carbohydrate diets. And with regard to our study, metabolic rate doesn't have to drop as much. Since the brain doesn't think the body is in a starvation mode, uh, metabolic rate can remain higher, which of course will help you feel good, help you be more physically active, want to get off the couch and work out, and support the likelihood that you'll keep those, calorie, calorie, those pounds off over the long term. Pretty amazing stuff, and, and to kind of capstone that discussion right there, one of the findings of your study was the different effects of leptin lowering based upon carbohydrate intake, and it seemed, if I interpreted your study correctly, adiponectin increased most profoundly in the low-carb group and leptin decreased compared to the high-carb group more not, so. We haven't reported the results of adiponectin okay. yet, but what we did look at was leptin and ghrelin. And so ghrelin is the hunger hormone, uh, which is made in the stomach that makes you hungry, but it also has metabolic effects. It's fairly clear, at least in animals, that high leptin not only causes you to eat more, but shifts your metabolism to fat storage. You know, that's a fine thing to have to help you save, store calories, get, get through the winter, um, if there is gonna be, you know, a famine coming, but that's not the state you wanna be in if you are trying to lose weight. And so we found that the low carb diet lowered leptin more. That's gonna be advantageous, again, for hunger control, possibly metabolically. We also found some evidence that leptin sensitivity improved on the low carbohydrate diet, but that's gonna require more investigation. More deeper testing and everything like that. Yeah, we're, we have other ongoing analyses of these data to look at other hormones. We wanna look at the thyroid axis, because oh, well. we know thyroid's gonna affect metabolism. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening to the stress hormones, uh, the reproductive hormones. You know, when the body, one of the things that we know happens, especially to women's bodies when they're calorie deprived, is that they shut down the reproductive axis. So women with anorexia. In obesity, women, um, especially if there's insulin resistance, can have a variety of other kinds of disordered reproductive issues, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So uh, we're gonna be interested to see how these reproductive hormones change both in women and in men. Amazing. So you have the, the blood 
that still from the, those groups? Or are you going to attack do. them yeah, over time? Yeah, we've got lots of, so lots of samples. We're going to do a lot of analysis. We've got fat cell biopsies. We're going to be doing analyses. Oh, my gosh. Uh, we've got, actually, I'm not really at liberty to talk about the results, but we have some fascinating new data on cardiovascular disease risk factors that are going to um, perhaps uh, help us... Uh, uh, examine some current recommendations as they relate to high intakes of saturated fat. Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, Exciting. so there's no question that a lot of saturated, in my mind, that a high saturated fat on a high carbohydrate diet is not a good combination. Bread and butter do not, you know, that's not good for your heart. But the question is, if you reduce carbohydrate a lot, get rid of the processed carbohydrates, lower insulin. Does saturated fat still have the same adverse effects, or does that saturated fat get oxidized much more quickly and not really cause much of a problem? So we're going to be able to address that question in more detail. Amazing. And if folks want to follow you on Twitter and Facebook, is yeah. that going to be the best resource where they can be updated when these updates come about? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Follow me on uh, Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I'm uh, uh, David Ludwig, MD. David Ludwig, MD, on uh, Twitter or Facebook. We also have a new study we're running, which is uh, going to take our last study to the next level, where instead of just feeding people all of their meals, we're bringing them in, in this case, to a beautiful, isolated uh, lakeside retreat center in the forest, where, uh, in effect, you get a kind of a paid vacation, spend three months there while you are feeding you different diets and studying metabolism. So if you're interested, in, especially if you live in the uh, New England area, uh, and want to spend three months, um, you know, uh, if you can, your work allows you to spend three months away or if you're between jobs, contact us through Children's Hospital Boston and uh, we'd be happy to consider you as a potential participant. You can advance science while you're losing weight and um, eating well. That's amazing. So you'll look at the effects of stress on cardiometabolic parameters as well. Is that part of the impetus to go on a retreat like that? Um, no. This Well, this new study is so that we can have even greater control over diets. You know, our last study fed people all their meals, so that's going to be a much uh, more sophisticated way to change diets than your typical behavioral study, where you just tell people to eat this or that, and they have difficulty putting it into practice. And oftentimes, the two diet groups don't really differ much in what they're eating, so we can't learn all that much. So we fed people all of their meals for a full academic year, but they were living on their own, and we know that there's going to be some degree of non-compliance. You know, some people aren't going to fully eat the meals we gave them, or they might eat some other things. We know from our bio measures that the groups in our recent study did eat quite differently. We saw uh, triglycerides, HDL, and um, something called um, 1,5-AG, kind of a carbohydrate-related biomarker. These differed very substantially, so we know that we had good differentiation. But we can take that to the maximum degree by um, our new study, where we're going to have 24-7 oversight of what people are eating. Mm -hmm. um, It'll be uh, sort of like uh, being in prison, although it's going to be a lovely prison. and uh, <laughs> Much better experience. You're going to be free to take walks in the, in the woods or you know, go swimming in the lake. And, uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I commend you for all the work that you're doing in your book, Always uh, Hungry, is available as well. Uh, I mean, yep. So, so folks, check was, that out. Yeah, Always Hungry is, uh, uh, we try to summarize the science uh, that we've just been discussing, especially Amazing. around the carbohydrate insulin model. And then we provide a, a three-phase program. And lastly, we also have a Facebook group that, uh, based around our, um, our nutritional program, and my wife helps lead this, we have about 15,000 people. It's free and non-commercial. Anybody can join. You don't have to pay anything. We don't promote any products. It's an opportunity for people to get together and either you know, both uh, follow our meal plan, get support from us, or get new recipes and meal plans, support each other in ways that relate to diet or just in ways that relate to helping to make our environment a healthier place for our children and ourselves to live. Um, ultimately, you know, we have to address diet-related diseases if we're gonna maintain a viable society. You know, 
especially especially relating to the kids. I love it. And final question here is the carbohydrate hypo carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. How much more data do we need until we know that's kind of like maybe not so much a hypothesis right. anymore? Well, we call it a you know carbohydrate insulin model or a hypothesis, but um, you know it's important to understand that no one study can ever either prove or what some people have used the term falsify a model such as this. Um, we, th these are intellectual avenues of thought that date back a century or more. Um, they relate to um, basic questions about our metabolism, you know, our diet, our hormones, and um, the nature of nutrition research is that um, you, can't you can't ask every question in one study and you can't do so perfectly. Um, we need many different kinds of studies. I think we have to have some humility on both sides of the debate. The answer will undoubtedly be greater than either side would think. But you know, we've tried calorie balance. We've tried the approach of eating less and moving more for decades. I mean, you can't go to the store and look at any kind of packaged food with a ca without a calorie count. You know, we've heard about low-fat diets. The reason that people have advocated low-fat diets is because they're supposed to be inherently lower in calories. Fat has a lot of calories. You know, people have, have tried calorie restriction for decades. It's not working. This isn't simply a problem with willpower. The body fights back against calorie restriction. That's something that most dieters experience long before their goal weight is in, within sight. We can't just blame people. We can't just tell them to you know, exert more discipline. We need new ways of thinking. The carbohydrate insulin model might not be totally right, but it provides a compelling alternative way of thinking um, that explains the obesity epidemic, that it occurred just as those processed carbohydrates were flooding our diet. It provides an infrastructure for understanding how many more things than just carbohydrate could be influencing our fat cells, and it gives us a biological treatment that's focused on the fat cells. It destigmatizes uh, people with this particular problem because if it is a largely biological you know it's no different than type 1 diabetes or cancer or heart disease we focus on the biological dr drivers we don't blame people if it's all a question of just calorie balance and willpower you know that's implicitly creating you know in a, a, a mindset um, that will lead to stigmatization of people because you know, there's this going to be this assumption that if you can't control your calorie balance, there's something the matter with you. Your lack of discipline, willpower, you know, maybe it's a character issue. We know these stereotypes have um, applied to people with obesity, sometimes with tragic consequences, even in childhood. We need to understand, a bio we need to understand the bio biology better in a way that has direct application in the clinic. And that's one of the great appeals of the carbohydrate insulin model. We need to fund it better. Um, lastly, I'll just say that you know it's the, you know the society, in the form of the pharmaceutical industry, thinks nothing about spending a billion dollars with a B, billion dollars to develop just one drug for one diet-related disease like cholesterol or high blood pressure or blood sugar, and yet studies in nutrition to do the rigorous research go begging on a shoestring budget. The average, you know, the maximum NIH grant is about two million dollars for studies that are actually more complicated than a drug trial. So, you know, we need the government to better fund research and in the interim we need philanthropy to step in and fill up the difference. Yeah, that's huge. Well, Dr. Ludwig, thanks so much for all the great work, your okay. book, and doing the research. And thanks to all of you for joining and watching this. Please share this with a friend or family member that can benefit. We're reporting to you live from the Metabolic Health Summit in Long Beach, California. Really appreciate you coming yeah, on. Sure. Thank you.